Time to talk bastions, gun emplacements and repair shops. Let's look through every fortification in Warhammer 40k and talk about who's is best. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're talking fortifications, the static buildings, bunkers and various other bits that you can deploy in your deployment zone and typically don't move. Games Workshop does seem to be on a bit of a drive to give every faction one of these, though I must admit their rules in 9th edition are a little bit problematic, and aside from looks, about half of them do seem to be utterly worthless at the moment. In any case, in this video let's go through all of them. We'll start with talking about the fortifications rules in general, then move on to the generic ones that all factions can take, and then we'll go through each faction's fortifications in turn, and talk about how they might be used. So in 9th edition, fortifications are generally fairly easy to include in your army. You take them in their own detachment, and if their faction keyword is the same as your army one, they cost very few CP indeed. Despite this though, they are quite a rare sight in any sort of competitive list, perhaps more because of the way that the rules of 9th edition are written more than anything else. Perhaps the biggest positive for the fortifications is that they're universally very very tough, for the points you get a good number of usually toughness 8 wounds with a 3 plus armour save, often as a compensation for not moving or not dealing direct damage to the foe. That does come with two major downsides though, the first and most obvious one being that they're immobile, in 9th edition mobility really is king, there's typically lots of line of sight blocking terrain around, so if you have a fortification that shoots things and doesn't move, it's often going to be fairly easy to hide the important stuff from it, it gives your opponent something to work around, and maybe just means they can focus their attention on other sides of the battlefield. In addition, if it is a fortification with a profile, then it means that the opponent could just charge it in melee, and then perhaps tie up any shooting that it has, and prevent the enemy army from shooting them. It means that you have to think pretty hard about where fortifications are going to be placed, and potentially if you are playing a mainly shooting army, you'll probably either need to screen them, or have a counter charge threat in place to scrape any enemies off that are clinging to your fortress. Really though, the biggest problem with fielding fortifications in 9th edition at the moment is a little FAQ in the core rulebook that puts some severe restrictions on where they can actually be deployed. I think it was shortly after 9th edition came out that Games Workshop added this one, saying that you can't set up fortifications within 3 inches of terrain features, excluding hills. I feel like probably the main motivation for this might have been to stop you blocking movement lanes off, say using one of the fortifications that can't be killed, and just plonking it down between two narrow buildings, meaning that your opponent can't get things like monster door vehicles through those gaps. I guess the rule certainly goes some way to preventing that, but on the busy tables of 9th edition, it really means that you might not have all that much choice of where your fortification goes down, and perhaps even on some tables you might have nowhere that you can set up at all, particularly for some of the bigger fortifications. Generally it means that unless you're making specific accommodation to make sure that players can put them down, most players will have little or no choice of where they actually place them. I would say that that's the single biggest reason that they're not considered competitive, as if you turn up to a gaming table and you find out that one of your units can't even be deployed properly, then you may as well have taken something else. Some gaming systems do try and get around this, a couple of tournaments use something called player place terrain, that way you can deliberately leave space for a fortification if needed, though they're very much the exception and not the rule. A lot of the big ones tend to use static and pre-measured out deployment maps. In more casual games of course, you can just talk it out with your opponent, though I think it is a bit unhelpful to leave that negotiation up to players. I think the general expectation is that if you've paid points for a model to be included in your army, and fortifications are part of the game, they should be in some way playable. But with busy 9th edition terrain boards, Games Workshop doesn't seem to have found a good way to make that happen yet. In any case, through the rest of the video we'll talk as if we can use the fortifications meaningfully, though I fully admit that that 3 inch clearance rule kind of throws a spanner in the works for every single one of them. First up, let's start with the more generic ones, the ones that have just recently been reprinted in Warzone Octarius. These have the unaligned keyword, meaning that you can field them in any army. There used to be a fair amount more of these, I believe in a previous chapter approved, but Games Workshop does seem to have cut the list down to just 5 of them. The terrain pieces that they currently sell, and they haven't got rules here for things like the Plasma Obliterator or the Vengeance Batteries, which I don't believe you can buy anymore. Perhaps the interesting one that they still sell but they don't have rules for is that Imperial Bunker. I guess they haven't said that you can't use it with the previous datasheet, but it does feel like the Octarius book was designed to replace that chapter approved. In any case, starting out we have the Mighty Bastion, 180 points, and a massive 18 wounds with toughness 8 and a 3 plus save. This one's basically a good place for troops to fire out of, it can transport 15 infantry, the big chunky ones with 3 or 4 wounds take more spaces, and either 10 or 15 can fire out depending on whether or not you take the fire hatch 
or you put any other upgrades on top. It gets four heavy bolters included, and you can upgrade for a top gun option, though I think it's probably not worth it. And for a fun command point generator, if you use the comms array on top, you get to roll on a 5 plus for a command point each turn if you have a character embarked. Usually I suspect that's not going to be worth keeping your character locked away for, but I think that's quite a nice touch. As with all these book fortifications, I do feel that they're really quite expensive for what they do, but if there was ever going to be a use for the Bastion, it'd be providing a nice safe haven for fragile gun troops to fire out of. Perhaps squads like Eldar Dark Reapers, Chaos Havocs, or Orc Tank Busters or Looters. Things that hopefully have very good damage output, but really can't face to be in the line of enemy fire. Next we have the Aegis Defence Line, 100 points for what is basically a barricade, and you can pay a few more if you want the gun emplacement on the end, which is toughness 7 and 3 wounds, and usually fires on a 4 plus if it's being operated. The barricades are both light and heavy cover, and also defensible, which could be really quite nice if you just need lots of units in the open with better cover, but again for 100 points for the whole thing, it does seem a bit steep. I guess if you could put it down on an exposed objective, it could make it easier for your troops to hold it, particularly if the troops have excessively high saves already, maybe things like terminators with storm shields. Next up we have the Sky Shield landing pad, this one's 140 points and can't be destroyed. In its normal configuration it gives light and heavy cover to things like infantry on top of it, as well as giving anything on top of it a 6 plus invul save as well. Again, not terrible to have, but for 140 points it's hard to imagine the light cover being better than just taking more units. Interestingly, from a more narrative point of view, it can be unfurled to give aircraft an action that heals 3 wounds for them and replenish any one used weapons. Though I think typically with aircraft in 40k, you're not really going to want to sacrifice their shooting for a turn just to heal up a bit. Kind of the whole point of them is that they need to be winging about the battlefield causing as much havoc as possible, and not just face being ignored. The Void Shield Generator's 200 points, that's 16 wounds at toughness 8 and a 4 plus save. It does have a relatively powerful rule, giving out a 5 plus invul save to any units within 12 inches of it, then 9 and 6 inches as it gradually degrades. Now getting a 5 plus invul save on anything in the game could be really powerful. Anything with a 3 plus save or worse is really going to thank you for this. Particularly things that are happy enough just to castle up in one place and rain down firepower from a long way away. However, I don't think that ability is ever going to be worth 200 points really. Whatever you're protecting, you could likely afford far more of it if you just didn't take this along. And even a few of the armies that would want to use this have other ways to get it elsewhere. Say space marines with a librarian with psychic fortress or orcs with their force field generators. Finally we have the Fortress of Redemption, the 440 point monster. It's basically a bastion on steroids, 30 wounds at toughness 8, and packs a little bit of firepower with 2 damage d3 plus 3 last cannons, and d6 missile shots at strength 3, ap minus 3, and damage 3. Again, basically like the bastion, I think its main purpose is to transport lots of models that can fire out of it, and for that purpose it does seem kind of well balanced against the bastion. I feel like there is probably some advantage in just having all of those wounds in one big mass, so unless your opponent can really dedicate a ton of firepower to this early, they're going to struggle to bring it down. Again, it does seem really quite pricey for what you get. I think to make best use of this, you need a whole load of fragile gun troops that need the protection, plus maybe some hard-hitting combat troops that could sally forth out of it, and if the enemy got too close, do a bit of counter-charging. Overall, I can't really see any of these being used in many strong lists, not out of any really specific, more casual games. Maybe when you know that there's not going to be all that much terrain on the table, or you're playing a really big apocalypse sized game, and the Void Shields Generator's shields might be protecting enough to be worth it. In any case, let's go through all of the faction specific fortifications now. We'll start with the Imperium, and then go through to Chaos and Xenos. The Space Marines have their Hammerfall Drop Bunker. 175 points at 14 wounds with a toughness 8. This one basically is just a gun turret, firing out its Super Crack and Super Frag missiles basically a cyclone missile launcher with better range and plus 2 strength. The interesting thing about this is that it does have potentially unlimited damage output. Its heavy bolters or heavy flamers get to target literally everything within line of sight, but you only get to target it with one heavy bolter profile or one heavy flamer profile. Realistically, it just means it's not going to do all that much damage at a 2k level in 40k, particularly on boards that have quite a lot of terrain. If the firepower is important for the opponent to avoid, it will be stationary, so they should be able to hide if they really want to. Again, maybe like the Void Shield Generator, it might come into its own in some truly massive games. If you manage to get it with literally dozens and dozens of units within range of it, then all those heavy bolter shots could be a big deal. Marines and Guard also get these Tarantula Sentry Turrets as well, 40-50 to 50 point gun platforms, 
toughness 5, 4 wounds and a 3 plus save, and they basically shoot their twin heavy bolters or twin last cannons at ballistic skill 4 at the nearest infantry or vehicle target respectively. Realistically, I think these guys are going to struggle to outcompete even things like standard devastators armed with the same gear. The devastators hit on 3s, get a whole bunch more synergy, and are able to move if they don't have targets. I think these guys' firepower would have to be quite good to justify being completely static. For the Battle Sisters, we have the Battle Sanctum at 80 points, essentially an extra ruin in your deployment zone that can give some obscuring cover. It gives you a bit of a leadership boost, and it also allows one of your characters to pray for a miracle dice each turn as an action, and that could be achieved with something very very cheap, like a 25 point Preacher. It is quite nice to guarantee a good line of sight blocking ruin just where you need it, perhaps, and miracle dice are pretty nice, there's not that many ways to basically auto-generate miracle dice in Sisters of Battle anymore, and it's perhaps particularly powerful for armies like Ebon Chalice, which can guarantee a few more sixes. I seem to remember one making an appearance in a player place terrain winning list. I believe it was John Lennon's Battle Sisters that won the LSO. Shows it has at least some use if you are able to set the thing up. Lastly, we have the Sacristan Forge Shrine for the Imperial Knights, an 85 point little structure that gives the Knights the option to charge up for a turn, giving up both shooting and charging to get one of three different buffs. Either you can heal the knight, d3 wounds, guarantee that you're going to be getting the maximum number of shots out of a random shot weapon, for example for going shooting with your rapid fire battle cannon knight and then being able to fire the full 12 shots next turn, or boosting their movement by an extra 6 inches next turn. The main issue with these is that you have to give up shooting and charging with a really quite powerful model, and the benefits that you get next turn are kind of marginal. You'll average more shots with your rapid fire battle cannon if you just fire it twice normally for example, and gaining extra movement seems a bit of a wash if you could have been using your movement this turn to get forward to the enemy rather than hanging about the forge shrine. There's definitely some situations where it would be useful, such as if all of the enemy was hidden turn 1, then you could soup up your weapons and wait for them to appear. I'm just not sure it's necessarily worth the 85 points. I guess one of its better uses might actually be providing something like dense cover to armager helverins. Maybe you could have a couple of them loitering around by this, not having the penalty themselves as they're peeking out of it, but because part of their base is obscured, it could be minus 1 to hit. Overall, it does have some uses, but maybe not as much just compared with getting an extra half a warglaive or something. Next up, we come to the Chaos Fortifications, and we'll start with the Demons. The first one they have is the Feculent Narmor for 95 points, and this one I think is quite an interesting one. The Spooky Nurgle Tree of Disease gives you a bunch of different bonuses. Nurgle Demon units get light cover and plus one to their armor save, and nearby Nurgle Demon units can also shoot and charge if they're falling back or advancing. As well as that, it also gives you the potential to do some mortal wounds up close. These were somewhat popular back in 8th edition when Plague Bearer Horde lists were all the rage. I think for them it was mainly the opportunity to fall back and charge or advance and charge that sold them, though now in 9th even the Plague Bearers can't really hold up to the sheer amount of lethality. I feel like the tree might well be best with things like Nurgle Possessed or Nurgle Obliterators now, maybe allied from Chaos Space Marines. The Obliterators would certainly love a massive extra cover save and the opportunity to fall back and shoot, and the Possessed could perhaps have a turn of protection and then give that up for the advancing and charging, though I admit that that's probably better done with the Celeste Attachment and the Herald that can give them it on the move. Still though, I think it's one of the more interesting and powerful fortifications. The other one for the Demons, which is still in the Vigilus Ablaze book I believe, is the Skull Altar. This one's 110 points and a fair bit worse. It does help Corn Demons out by boosting up their Loci of Rage for their characters, gives a minus one to cast for Psychers when they're very close indeed, and gives potentially quite a fun buff to Corn Demons, where if you have a character standing on the altar, then it gives friendly corn demons within 16 inches plus 1 attack. Unfortunately, I'm just not really convinced that that's all that good. It would probably be best with things like blood letters, though they aren't exactly that strong right now, and it might be a lot more helpful if that buff was on something mobile, so you don't just risk charging out of range of it. I think the Nurgle Tree is by far the stronger demon fortification. For the Chaos Marines, we have the Noctilith Crown at 85 points, 14 wounds at toughness 8 with a 3 plus save, and this little blackstone portal gives you a few different bonuses. It makes enemy psychers peril a bit easier within 24 inches, perilsing on every double rather than just a double 1 or a double 6. Chaos psychers get to reroll their cast within 6 inches, and it also gives a 6 inch aura of 5 plus invul saves to models within 6 inches. I feel like it's perhaps one of the ones that might nearly get there. If you're making good use of both the invul save and the casting buff, it could be worth it. You need to go heavy on the Chaos Marine gun platforms though that don't get an invul save of their own. 
which isn't really all that many of them, given a lot of their stronger gunline units are either Forge World Demon things or Contempt of Dreadnoughts. The buff to casting is quite nice, but it would mean that your Psychers would have to hang around the crown rather than going off where they want to, and that could shut down your mobility a bit. Overall, I don't think it's absolutely terrible, but very niche in application, and maybe doesn't fit in very well with what Chaos armies typically want to do. Finally for Chaos, we have the Miasmic Malignifier, the Death Guard Furnace of Diseases, and perhaps one of the most interesting fortifications out of the lot. It's Toughness 8, 12 wounds and a 3 plus armor save, gets disgustingly resilient for minus 1 damage, and gets to set up in the midfield, making its buffs far more relevant. I think the dream would be to place this somewhere near a midfield objective, one that your opponent and you are going to be scrapping over, and then it's got a whole bunch of helpful things to go off with that. It generates contagion ranges out to 9 inches, so a lot more of the enemy might be minus 1 toughness to your shooting. It's got a genuinely quite solid close range flamer attack, which would genuinely wipe out squads of light infantry if they're trying to take that objective, and then if your death guard move up to it in the midfield, it can give them light or dense cover, maybe to make things like death shroud terminators even more annoying to remove. If your opponent shoots it, then they're shooting one of the toughest things in the whole death guard army of tough things, and it might even explode for a few mortal wounds against the enemy that doesn't affect the Nurgle units. Overall, I do really quite like these as a pretty cheap area denial nuisance. I think if people could guarantee their setup somewhere near an objective, then I think that more would be taken. Moving on to the Xenos, and we start with the Eldari. Their webway gate is 95 points, 14 wounds at toughness 8, but unfortunately it's just really quite overcosted for the only thing that it does, which is bringing in Eldari units from reserve. As Eldar can get a unrestricted deep strike with their webway strike anyway, it does feel a little bit pointless to me. Why would you pay for a fixed deep strike in one given location, where this still doesn't allow you to set up closer to the enemy than normal, or set up turn 1 in most match play games? I'd be quite surprised if we don't see some sort of change to this thing's rules once we get the new Eldar Codex. Next we have the Tyranid Spore Assist. It's 115 points for a toughness 6-12 wound critter. Like the Webway Gate and the Malignifier, it can set up closer to the enemy, and then it's a slightly more expensive nuisance unit that spawns spore mines, fires some more spore mines in the general direction of the enemy with its spore node, and has a bit of inaccurate firepower with its five ranged weapons. As fortifications go, it is at least fairly fragile, but it is quite fun that it can put down new spore mines all over the enemy, maybe block movement or deep strike opportunities perhaps, and maybe do a little bit of mortal wounds if they're lucky. Overall, certainly not one of the stronger Tyranid units, I think, but I think that one of these could be surprisingly annoying in the midfield against an opponent with some slow-moving units that you could move block. For the Gene Stiller Colts, we have the Tectonic Frag Drill at 80 points. This one's an unkillable mining rig. If you've got some Gene Stiller Colt models about on it, then you can activate the drill to make charges nearby a little bit harder, and once per game it does a sort of beam mortal wound effect, where it has the potential for doing several D3 mortal wounds to enemy units, depending on how well they line up in a straight line. It's a fun model, but it just doesn't really do all that much. Seems hard to justify compared with just taking more units. For the tower, we have their Tide War fortifications. These are split up into their shield line, gun rig, and drone port, all essentially functioning like transport vehicles that you can put fire warriors and things on. All of them can fire down at the enemy as it floats towards them and each of the fortification sections have their own quirks. The shield line's only toughness 6 at 75 points, but it gets the chance to reflect a couple of mortal wounds back at the enemy if you're lucky. The gun rig's 125, but comes with an inaccurate rail gun, and the drone port also allows you to embark some drones on it too, potentially for multiple units falling out of it once it dies. It's quite fun to have fortifications that actually move around, but in general tower players seem to much prefer the devilfish these days. I can see why, they move a bit faster, pack a little bit more firepower, and just generally seem superior as a transport, aside from the being able to fire out of it thing. The Orcs are blessed with two different fortifications, the first being this Big Ed boss bunker that came out kind of recently. 75 points for a big Toughness 8, 12 wound, 3 plus save thing with Ramshackle. So again, like the Death Guard one, an absolute pain to take down for its cost. It's got a transport capacity of 10 models, which can all fire out of it if they desire can potentially make a war boss's aura bigger, though I don't think that that usually makes much sense compared with having the war boss out and fighting, but really the most interesting thing is the fact that this can be teleported into battle for 2 CP, along with a murderous squad of orcs, things like looters, tank busters, or flash kits. The best thing about this is that the models inside always count as remaining stationary, so it means that you could have your tank busters hitting on 5s with their D3 rocket shots each rather than 6s, and of course even better against vehicles. 
Not only that, but the boss bunker has some actual fairly decent shooting all of its own. Its gaze of Gork can either auto hit a vehicle for strength 9, AP minus 3 and 3 damage, or a fun sort of area effect one that's a bit more anti-inventory focused. In general, just for the raw stats and damage alone, this thing is kind of efficient, and if there is enough room to deploy it and get your tank busters down on something juicy, a teleported one of these could genuinely be an incredibly scary threat, and one that's really quite tough to deal with once down, just because of how tough it is for the cheap points. For the Mechboy Workshop, the news maybe isn't quite as good. 70 points for a few buffs to mech-related things, it allows mechs to repair a bit better, allows you to take two copies of the same custom job in army construction, and a mech can do an action to hand out an extra custom job mid-game to a nearby vehicle. The custom jobs are kind of okay, but not standout, perhaps. I guess you could think about one of these if you wanted to support a really massive vehicle, perhaps, but for the 70 points plus having a mech to operate it does seem a little bit underwhelming to me. Finally, for the Necrons, we have the Convergence of Dominion, 120 points for these three Lodestones, again, some of the very best defence that you can get in the game for the cost, 120 points for 30 toughness 8 wounds with a 3 plus save is pretty ridiculous. The opponent would certainly struggle to chew through them, but that might not really matter that much, as they can be safely ignored most of the time. I've got a close range shooting attack with D3 strength 4, AP minus 3, damage 3 attacks, maybe good to eat a space marine from time to time. They give out command protocols to nearby Necron units and give them plus 2 leadership, though usually that's not going to matter too much with a massive leadership 10 to start with. They do seem vaguely annoying to have around for your opponents. Certainly any time they do shoot or make an attack on these, it's likely going to be in your favour if it could have been going somewhere else. Still though, just for the buffs and damage alone, I think these are very rarely ever going to be worth it, even at 120 points. I think they perhaps just needed to be a little bit more helpful or threatening to warrant their inclusion. Finally, for the 412 Necrons, we also have the Sentry Pylon, 100 to 125 points, at toughness 7, 8 wounds and a 3 plus save. Out of its guns, I'd be thinking about the Heat Cannon most, it gives you some okay anti-tank damage, D6 shots at strength 8, AP minus 4 and damage D6 with the Melter Rule. Just for raw firepower alone, it does compete fairly well with things like the Doomstalker, but again, the main issue with this thing is that it doesn't move, so it's more of an area denial thing than anything else. The opponent might well just be able to hide their units out of line of sight if they really don't want to get shot by that heat blast. I feel like one might not be the worst include in an army, but you probably don't want to go spamming these. So I think that just about brings us to the end of our look through our fortifications of 40k. If I'd had to rank strongest overall, I'd probably give it to these four. The Battle Sanctum for some all-important line of sight and farming miracle dice. The Narmor maybe being better for allied Nurgle with Chaos Possessed or Obliterators. The Miasmic Malignifier just generally being annoying and very very tough on midfield objectives. And the Orky Teleported Big Head Boss Bonker suddenly appearing and firing off a whole bunch of rockets with its tank busters. I'll be interested to hear if you think that these are also the strongest or if I've underrated any of the others. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics where I'll certainly be keeping the regular 40k content coming with new videos out just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the things on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page, and you can find that down in the video description below. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, including seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.